instead of the cloud. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So this session is on using streaming video in spring courses. This came about in large part because um, my co-presenter and colleague in Lamson Library, Alice Perriman, had been hearing from a lot of faculty who were looking for advice about both finding um, videos to use and accessing those videos, as well as some technical um, assistance. I wanna be completely upfront and say, neither of us are um, IT staff, but <laughs> we're gonna do our best to give you some um, best practices and tips that we've both experienced. Um, and with that, the last thing I'm going to do, like I said, there's so many moving parts. I'm gonna turn captioning on for this. Um, for anybody who is watching, um, you should be able to see captions for uh, myself and Alice. Those captions to come through, I have to take my headphones off um, so that Alice's audio comes through on my computer. So I'm just warning you that there is a dog in the room. So if you hear barking in the captioning, that is why. Um, and Alice, do you want to go ahead and get us started? Yes, and lots of moving parts, as you said. So, um, right, so this is, I'll just maybe struggle through a couple of parts. <laughs> I agree, Liz. I'm also really curious to see how barking would be. How barking sounds in captioning. Um, and this slide is just an outline of what we're going to be covering today, um, the streaming services that are available. We'll talk a little bit about some of the ins and outs of streaming video in your class, both technical and maybe some more um, pedagogical and practical tips as well. Right. So, yes, thank you. Next slide. Um, right. So the stream, I'm just going to walk through the streaming services that are available from Lamson Library. Um, most of you should have gotten an email back in December that we are transitioning this semester uh, to academic video online as our primary uh, streaming video uh, vendor. And so what that means is basically um, Canopy, where you used to be able to go to that database, if any of you are familiar with using Canopy, you could go there, you could you know, browse through the 70,000 plus films, you could click on one and watch it, done, easy. Um, now, when you go there, if it's not content that we've already purchased, you will be presented with a request form. And so I will say this a few times, we do not want to prevent you from having resources that you need for your class. So if it's something that you do need, please use the request form. It'll go to me and we will facilitate purchase of that video. Uh, so that will continue through the spring, um, understanding, of course, that we're doing a lot of online hybrid high flex teaching. We want to make sure that we have as much streaming available as possible. So our new platform, I'm just going to do a really brief show and tell because it is a little jarring when you first use it, uh, academic video online. I'm going to hopefully share my screen. I'm going to stop and turn it over to you, Alice. Great. Okay, so share my screen. Here we are. Excellent. Okay, so um, academic video online. I hope you all would know uh, that you would get to our databases through the library homepage. And here it is. Um, I've already got it open. So basically, when you come to this homepage, they have about the same amount of content as Canopy did, um, about 70,000 plus. Um, I have had questions about overlap with the content, and it's about a third. I have not looked at all 70,000 titles and compared them title by title. I hope you all forgive me for that. Um, but actually, some other media librarians have um, people who are special, you know, specialists in media, and it's about a third seems to be what the consensus is. So if you were using content in Canopy, it might be here. Um, so it's worth checking. Uh, so anyhow, if I were just to start scrolling, I would eventually scroll through 70,000 videos, which is not very practical. Uh, so the way to browse, you click this fun filter thing and it will open up um, options for subject, publisher, person, content type, language, and date. Um, and I'll just show off the subject a little bit. Um, lots of different subjects, obviously. You can search them. So if I were to search for healthcare, actually I'm just gonna keep it to health. Um, we can see all of the different health related subjects. 
And when you click on one, it will both narrow your results. So I have 2,390 health sciences films, and it will also show you a subset of the subjects within that, uh, which is pretty nice. I'm just gonna stick to this uh, just for this demo. And also I wanna narrow down to things that are recent because that's always handy. And so that gets me 54 and you can see 54. Um, and here they are. So you could just scroll through the 54 and just click on any one of these um, to actually play the video. There's one other thing I want to show you. I will say this is a very busy screen, which I'm not thrilled about, but once you learn your way around it, it's fine. Um, this is all of your, you know, full screen, all those options. And then up here is all detail about the video. You can get the transcript and this is where you would share. Uh, so if you wanted to embed this in your Moodle course, this is where you would access the permalink and copy that and you can place it into your Moodle course and Martha and academic technology can talk much more about that <laughs> option. Uh, so that's how all of that would work. And of course, please feel free to ask if you're ever um, struggling with that. Uh, the only other thing I really wanna point out with this is that we do, it's kind of fun. They also have this channels thing, which I think is nice because it highlights some of the really premium content. So like all of the PBS content, Sony Picture Classics, um, BBC um, Film Platform is an excellent documentary provider. Um, you'll probably recognize some of the titles on the screen. Uh, so it's a really nice resource and I hope that you make um, good and fun use of it. Um, so I am going to stop sharing so we can get back to our slides. I don't have slides. I don't remember what the heck I'm talking about. <laughs> and um, yes, right. Okay. Um, so I also wanted to just mention uh, Swank Digital Campus. Uh, that provides us with a limited number of Hollywood feature type films. Uh, we paid a certain a subscription fee to access a certain number. And those are also available from that library databases. Um, list. So those are primarily films that were used for, you know, media studies and film classes and things like that. Um, but again, I want to reiterate, um, if you don't see what would be useful to you, please ask your librarian, um, whether it's a subject or a particular title. I had a fantasy that I would come up with this list of free video resources for this presentation, and then I started looking into it and talking to some other media librarians. And I learned that there's an insane amount. <laughs> it's huge. And actually a media librarian at Brown University has created a fantastic list. It's in a very clunky Excel spreadsheet. There's some Brown specific stuff in there, which is why I'm not just sharing it with you. Uh, but if you need something, you know, really niche or, or not, you know, just, and you can't find it, please reach out and let us know and we will you know, use the resources of the greater library community to try to find it for you. And so just, um, you know, one parting, parting thought. Um, so again, with Canopy, if you were used to using it, um, these are by request now. And we do have a list of the films licensed with expiration dates. So if there's a film that you're using in Canopy, might be a good idea to check that just to make sure it doesn't expire like in March. Um, and if it does, let me know and, and we'll just extend the license for you. Uh, so that's just one final, final information there. And Martha, I think over to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to take us now to, in a slightly different direction and talk a little bit about the practicality of using streaming video um, or video even on your computer, but mostly focusing on streaming video um, over um, Zoom in various uh, situations. And I want to start this by kind of breaking down exactly what happens when we do this. Um, so let's say you're teaching a class and you've decided to show the amazing documentary Fantastic Fungi, which I hear is an amazing documentary. We should all watch it. Um, so this originates with whatever streaming service you're using is where Fantastic Fungi is coming from, whether that's something you found through the library or some other service. Um, you're streaming that, this little arrow shows it's coming down and then from there it's coming to your computer, um, which is where you can both view it and um, share it via screen sharing on Zoom. Um, from there, it's going to Zoom servers. 
and from Zoom servers, it's then getting processed um, and sent out to all of your students' various devices. Um, and Zoom is doing some compression um, of that video as it's sending it out. Your computer is also um, doing some comp compression as it's sending it to Zoom servers. So as you see, there's lots of different places here you know, where things can potentially go wrong. Um, so when we're experiencing technical issues with this, um, with, with playing streaming video over Zoom, it could, have to, it could have to do with your own internet, both the download that you're getting from Fantastic Fungi, wherever that's coming from, the upload speed from your computer to the Zoom server. It also can have to do with your computer, right? So if your computer is struggling a little bit in terms of resources to stream the video, if you have other things running in the background, that could certainly affect performance. And finally, it the last piece of this, the last mile is getting it to your students' devices. They have different internet connections. They have different um, uh, upload and download speeds as well. And depending on their internet and their devices, um, that could affect what they're seeing on their computers. So it's a pretty complex um, kind of technical situation in a way. I think we all kind of knew that, but I think it helps to know that, you know, this isn't you, <laughs> this isn't you that's failing. Um, when things go wrong with this, it usually has to do with lots of other pieces of the puzzle um, where there's just friction involved in getting these kinds of resources available. The good news is that lots of times it works. <laughs> um, uh, which is a testimony to how resilient some of these systems are um, at being able to adapt to various uh, technical scenarios. But a few general tips if you are experiencing difficulty with streaming resources over Zoom, especially streaming video, um, one thing to consider doing is restarting your computer before your Zoom session, before your class Zoom session. You may have things running in the background you're not even aware of, and restarting your computer is always a way to just start with a clean slate. Um, the one caveat to that is that I know some of us have things that start up automatically when our computer restarts. I very frequently have to go in and like shut stuff down that's been set to, re to start automatically. So kind of be aware of that and, um, and do an inventory if you feel like there's stuff that's starting automatically. Maybe there are things that you can, processes that you can stop um, before your Zoom session. Um, Another thing, I think most of us know this, but just to reemphasize, or if you have students who are Zooming um, and sharing video to make sure they know to use the desktop client and not um, the web interface for Zoom um, and to close any other unnecessary applications. This is um, a piece of advice I got from, from another university, from their website. There is a, a, a preference and setting that you can set in Zoom um, not in the Zoom client, but on the Zoom website uh, to disable hardware acceleration. And some people have found that helps when streaming over Zoom. So if you're having difficulty, that may be um, a setting that you want to look into. And let me just pause here for a moment and say you do not need to write down all these things. <laughs> these slides will be made available to you at the end of this, um, at, at the end of January Jamboree, so you can go back and look at this later. Um, and the last thing, um, if you don't know this, you should, which is that when you're streaming video, when you go to share screen, there is an option to share um, computer sound and optimize video clip. It's a little checkbox at the bottom of the share screen interface. I would show it to you, but the one thing you cannot show in Zoom is Zoom. Um, so you're just going to have to trust me that that's, those are settings. You want to check those off. Um, if you don't check off share computer sound, what happens is your students have to rely on hearing the audio through your computer speakers going back into your computer's microphone and into Zoom. If you click share computer audio or computer sound, uh, Zoom automatically captures that audio, um, which is just gonna be much clearer and more efficient than relying on the, on the audio from your computer. So a few other tips that are scenario related. So for synchronous, courses. These could be a fully online courses that you're teaching, or this could be a high flex situation where you've got some students in the classroom and some students um, remote. <coughs> Again, make sure you're sharing computer sound. That's super, super important in all of these scenarios. Um, the volume can be a little bit tricky. I know that I've had this experience when sharing over Zoom. You have a number of different places where you can set the volume. So there's volume in Zoom, which is usually linked to your computer volume. 
but that may depend a little bit on what you're using um, as your speakers. Um, and then your streaming service probably has a volume setting as well. So you may need to play around with those different volume settings and check with your students that they can hear and that it's not too loud on their end as well. They're gonna have to adjust their volume too. If they have their volume turned all the way up, they may need to turn it down depending on what you've um, set your volume to. Uh, make sure participants are muting microphones, obviously. Um, and if possible, if at, at all, try and test this beforehand to make sure the video plays and sound works. There's no reason it shouldn't, but it can be pretty stressful in the moment in class when you're trying to get all of the moving parts working um, to do this on the fly. So if you can quickly get on Zoom with a colleague or another a student maybe, um, and, and just make sure that they're able to see the video and hear the video, that's always really, really useful. Um, for asynchronous classes, so this would be classes that um, could be a high flex situation. So students who are remote, but not tuning into class, it could be an asynchronous online class or a hybrid class where you're meeting sometimes, but some activity is happening asynchronously. Um, if you're sending students to go look at media, make sure that they have the same access that you have. Um, this, the resources that Alice showed that the library has access to, all our students have access to, but you may have a video through some other service that you subscribe to that your students don't have access to. Um, so don't just assume that because you can see it, they can see it. Um, and this Netflix. is more pedagog, go ahead, Alice. I just wanted to throw in Netflix. Netflix. Yeah. For example, Netflix. Um, we do have faculty who like to rely on movies that you can get off of Netflix, which you know many of us assume is ubiquitous because it seems like every college student has a Netflix account, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, so polling your students and figuring out who has what access is really important. Um, this is more a pedagogical point, but do be explicit about your expectation that students watch the video. Um, you know, in their busy lives, they may decide that sitting down to watch an hour long video is something that they don't have time for. And if you've really relied on that uh, to deliver content, um, that can be a real problem in class. And the most important piece of advice I have there is really planning meaningful follow-up work, discussion activities that are linked to the video, not just saying, okay, this is a video, everybody go watch it. It's really important. And I'm gonna talk about that in a, in a minute as well. Um, and then the, this is, seems kind of obvious, but I just wanna make sure it, it's clear. Um, so if you're teaching a high flex class where you have students in person and you're streaming video for those who are remote um, and you're recording it, you certainly can share that recording with your asynchronous students. I would say that would be really important if you're stopping periodically to have conversation or discussion, if there's more than just the video that you want the students to um, experience. But if all it is is a recording of a video that they can watch on their own, it makes a lot more sense to just send them to watch that video on their own than to watch your recording of streaming the video, um, which probably won't be as good of quality um, and uh, may have other stuff in it that, that just is just a distraction for them. So just keep in mind that you know for asynchronous students, the simplest thing really um, whenever possible is to give them a link to go and watch the streaming video on their own. So the last piece of this that I wanna talk about in the last few minutes is teaching with video. Um, it's sort of teaching with streaming video, but this is really about teaching with video in general. Um, a lot of us, more and more of us as um, digital technologies have improved and become more ubiquitous and, um, and our ability to uh, pro provide these experience be experiences becomes easier and easier. More and more of us rely on video as a teaching resource. Uh, whether that's an experience that we build into a class session or it's something that we ask students to do outside of class. And that's for good reason. There's so many, as Alice has already alluded to, so many rich resources available um, in the form of digital video that can really augment your, your content, can really deepen students thinking, give them other perspectives. <laughs> um, it's also, you know, another another voice or another perspective from yours uh, for, for a class. And this can be everything from, you know, I think I'm mostly thinking about using documentary nonfiction type videos um, for those of us who are teaching classes that lend itself to that. But obviously if you're teaching a class where movies are relevant um, to, to the content, um, including video has become more and more um, 
something that is part of our practice as teachers. But sometimes I know I struggle with um, what, you know, how do we build that into our course itself? That's something other than just, we're gonna watch, a, we're gonna watch this documentary together, or I want you to go watch this movie. Um, what can we do to really make that uh, meaningful? Um, so I'm just gonna pull up some notes for myself here, hold on. Apologies, I should have done that earlier. Um, so the first uh, piece of advice is this to maybe set a mission for your students. So prime the pump um, before watching a video by giving them some guiding and critical questions to think about as they view some things that you want them to look for um, uh, or be aware of or uh, pay particular attention to as they're watching the video. Um, that will help focus their attention. In a way, all of these pieces of advice that, my, that I'm giving are about teaching uh, our students how to essentially read a video the same way that we um, ask them to read a text. Um, we, you know, some of our students struggle with reading a text, uh, particularly academic text, um, but they don't, they definitely probably don't have any training in how to read video um, in, that, in, in that way. So you can really help frame this experience in ways that will help them. The second piece um, of advice here is don't, you know, don't just assume you have to show the whole thing. Um, if, if a documentary is uh, over an hour long and you don't have that kind of class time or you're wary of whether or not students will actually go and watch um, an entire uh, a documentary or, or longer film, um, you can pull clips um, and play those in class. Um, and have discussions about those those short pieces to, uh, and as another way to prime the pump. Particularly, one way to do this is to show some shorter uh, clips in class, have discussion, and then have students watch the longer video on their own. And I'd um, like to just interject, Martha, um, academic video online will let you, you can create like your own personal account and you can create your own clips um, within that service. So it's really nice. You can, you know, customize that clip content. That is fantastic. I um, I was not aware of that, Alice. And I will say that's um, that's a really amazing feature. I just went through a project that we were doing in the collab, taking some longer videos and clipping them. And they're finding a good tool for that can be pretty tricky. So if you take the time to really curate a set of clips from some videos that um, that you've picked for your class, that can really help students to hone in on what you've decided is most important, make the best use of their time, or again, use those clips as objects for discussion in class and then ask them to watch the longer um, video once they've had that introduction and orientation um, on their own. Using pre-discussion, this is similar to setting a mission, but this isn't just you telling them, this is really having a conversation before the video to help charge the conversation, uh, charge the, um, charge them up a little bit before they watch the video. So talking a little bit about maybe what their expectations are, what they already know about this topic, what they think based on maybe some information about where the documentary or film comes from, what they expect to see, what they expect to learn. Um, again, as a way to just get them thinking critically about the, the video as an object of, um, of study. Some people are um, wary of doing this, but I do think um, it can be incredibly valuable, which is allowing a back channel for this kind of activity. Um, obviously, you don't want students interrupting and talking over the video, but there's no reason they can't have a chat discussion, whether that's in um, in the Zoom chat or in something like Teams um, where they can really talk about what they're seeing. I mean, you have to be a little prepared that if you're going to really allow students to back channel, it can get a little irreverent at times, um, but that's sort of the, the joy of the community of them coming together and, and processing the video collectively. I find that that um, can be a real community building exercise, but it also can bring some really interesting perspectives out as students talk about what they're seeing and how they're interpreting what they're seeing. Um, this is something that a lot of people recommend, which is building in sort of timed journal writing into, into doing video work. So you would do this at intervals, right? You would watch maybe the first 10 minutes, stop, um, have students give maybe pose a question um, at, or um, a prompt and have students do some free writing about what they've seen. If you want to, they could then share those back, but they don't have to. It really could be more process oriented as a way for them um, to think through what they've watched. Um, this is also another really kind of um, 
time tested strategy called monitor and repair. This is particularly useful if you're watch, watching, say, a documentary that's about a really complex or controversial topic where you really want to take moments during the video to stop, um, survey the class, get a sense of who's understanding what and repair any misconceptions or confusion. Um, similar to, you know, reading a text, if we get two pages in and we're so confused we don't know what we're reading, the next 10 pages aren't going to probably help. Um, so if you can, as an instructor, sort of intervene in those moments of confusion, um, help fix whatever problems might have arisen in terms of um, their understanding, um, that will make their, the, the rest of their experience that much, that much richer. Concept mapping, another great practice. You could do this um, synchronously during the video. That's a little tricky from a technical standpoint because having everybody have a video window open and some kind of concept mapping tool open could be tricky, um, but it's potentially possible, particularly in smaller groups. Um, but you also could do this afterwards. You could have students just take some notes while they're watching the video and then everybody go and concept map collectively what they've learned. Um, assigning a short summary, so having students after you've watched a clip or a whole video have to write some kind of summary and then share and compare afterwards what it is that they've written, what it is that they've learned, help them then repair any, um, help them help each other then repair any maybe uh, confusion or misconceptions or, or be oriented and introduced to other perspectives on what they've seen. Um, now we're moving into more kind of follow up stuff. So having students create a guiding questions document. Think about this as them creating like a viewer's guide um, for the video. Like if they were to put together a resource for people who are um, watching the video later, this is something that they could use. Um, and I know we're short on time, so I'm going to move through the last ones of these pretty quickly. Um, having critical sources, conversations about sources. This is definitely, I mean, just like working with the text. Um, if you're if you're doing something with a documentary, having them talk about well, where did the where did the evidence come from in this? Um, who are their sources? Having them track those down and do some uh, critical analysis of of the of the sources. A word cloud. This is a fun one where students would just, as they're watching a video, jot down words and phrases that seemed really important, and then at the end, put those all together in a word cloud tool. Um, and reflect a little bit on what becomes evident in terms of people's viewing and understanding of the video. Uh, creating a viewer tool. This is again a post activity where you might have them create an infographic, a web page, something that just helps a viewer to um, dive a little bit deeper, move laterally or deeper into a concept that was introduced. And then these last two, um, assign a find a follow up or make a follow up. This is really about either having students go out and find additional uh, video resources that are related to what they've learned um, as a follow up activity. But my favorite is having them make a follow up, which is um, watching videos is a, and learning how to read video is a great practice. Um, once students kind of learn how to read video, they become better at making video as well. So if they're watching a documentary, maybe their follow-up activity is to make some kind of explanatory video that dives deeper into a piece of what they've learned. So lots of different ideas there. Hopefully some of those spark um, people's imaginations. Um, we have no time. <laughs> we went right up to, to 10 o'clock. So I want to be cognizant of our time. I'm going to um, stop recording.